Seven years after the death of Plato, a boy named Epicurus was born and raised in the Athenian colony of Samos, an island state in the Mediterranean Sea. The boy grew up showing a disposition for scholarship and studied under those that followed the philosophy of Democritus, the atomist, and Plato, the idealist. In his 30s, Epicurus moved to Athens, where he established his own school, called the Garden, and taught his own sophisticated materialistic philosophy, which rejected Plato, but similarly turned away from Democritus and the skeptics under Pyrrho. The tradition that he founded, called Epicureanism, was one of the four great philosophical traditions of the Hellenistic world, the other three being Platonism, Aristotelianism, and Stoicism. However, precious little of Epicurus's own work comes down to the present day. Besides the usual fragments, citations, and summaries preserved in secondary sources, one of the most important places where we draw our current understanding of Epicureanism is from the work of a later Roman author called Lucretius. Unlike Epicurus, who used Greek, Lucretius wrote in Latin. Lucretius composed a work called On the Nature of Things, over two centuries after Epicurus's own time. Although coming from a later tradition of Epicureanism, this work attempts to take Epicurean task of explaining all natural phenomena through material causes, rather than resorting to supernatural causation. By examining the surviving fragments of Epicurus, what was written about him by often hostile contemporary and later sources, and the work of Lucretius, we can begin to build a system of thought that both surrounded Epicurus, but also developed upon the ideas which he himself built. Epicurus built his entire philosophical system on the basis of an atomistic physics. To him, the entirety of the world was made up of indivisible units which were too small to be perceived, drawing on the earlier atomism of Democritus. To establish this physics, Epicurus relied upon two brute facts for justification. One, there are such things as bodies in motion. And two, nothing can come out of nothing. From the first, we can deduce that if bodies are in motion, there must be something for them to move into, in this case, the void. From the second, if nothing can come out of nothing, then there must be some smaller primitive building block below di direct sensation, from which composite objects are formed and which are immutable, thus maintaining that there is something from which more complex bodies emerge. For Epicurus, it stood the reason that the universe, in which all these atoms and void coexisted, was infinite. He argued that if the universe was limited in size, you could merely move to the so-called edge of the universe and stick your fist out, thereby establishing the new limit of the universe. By repeating this action a theoretically infinite number of times, you would theoretically arrive at an infinite universe. Taking the infinitude of the void as a given, he then argues that we must similarly accept an infinity of atoms, because otherwise the atoms would have dispersed and no macroscopic objects would ever have formed. It is key to note the difference between Democritus and Epicurus's vision of atomism. Democritus has argued that collision and inertia were the only necessary causes which were required to describe the universe. However, Epicurus argued that this failed to explain why atoms had begun to move in the first place. Epicurus solved this dilemma by ascribing the property of weight to atoms. That is, all atoms were created with a natural inclination to move downwards. This created a secondary issue for Epicurus, for in an infinite universe, what was the orientation point for determining down, particularly as there was no bottom to move down towards? This is solved simply by arguing that the direction of down is merely the statistically favoured direction of atoms once collisions and initial movement worked out. In this case, Epicurus used the solution to solve the issue of gravity, which he claimed was merely the natural direction of the atoms. The Epicureans also attempted to solve a long-standing argument which was used to criticise atomic theory in the Greco-Roman world. If atoms were the smallest possible object, then clearly they were without parts. However, if they were without parts, then how could they bind together without any mechanism, for instance hooks or loops, to hold them together? The Epicurean solution to this was to argue that, although atoms were the smallest and indivisible quantity of matter, space itself was quantized in a way that was smaller again, in a minima, thus allowing for indivisible atoms to have parts. Clearly, this was in a time before modern physics with field theory and point-like objects. Epicurus and his follow followers also quantized time into small indivisible units. 
By quantizing time and space, the Epicureans argued that they had solved the problems that were posed by such thinkers as Parmenides and Zeno. However, such a system has its own issues. One such issue is what happened if two atoms approached each other at the same speed and were about to occupy the same minima quantity of space at the same minima quantity of time. How could they feasibly collide and then bounce off each other? It is not clear that the Epicureans answered this riddle. Although the Epicurean arguments of universal downwards movement due to weight and the quantization of space and time into minimas solved the problems of paradoxes of Zeno, one issue that was not solved was that if all particles merely had a tendency to fall downwards at a uniform rate, then how could any macroscopic object come into existence? Surely, everything would merely be a uniform downwards waterfall of atoms. To counter this, later Epicureans argued that atoms would occasionally and randomly swerve. When this occurred, they would collide and, if enough swerves occurred over an eternity, the macroscopic world of objects would come into existence. The swerve also served as an Epicurean rejection of material determinism. If you believed in Democritus's version of the atomism, you could argue for a mechanistic universe where the current events were merely the products of prior causal reactions. In the Epicurean sense, this swerve was completely random, and held the potentiality to preserve free will and, as a Lucretius said, break the bonds of fate. When it comes to fate and divinity, this is where Epicurus walks on thin ice. It was often claimed by detractors that Epicurus was an atheist, and some modern interpreters claim that his arguments surrounding the divine were merely a smokescreen to protect him from those who claimed that he denied the existence of the gods. From what evidence we have, it appears that Epicurus did not deny the existence of the gods, but merely sees them as uninterested in human affairs. When the gods, uninterested in divine intervention, he saw them as at best causal factors in natural phenomena, although it is unclear how this meshed with his atomistic materialism. Similar to Job, Epicurus also examined the problem of evil. However, from the point of the sceptic of the benevolent divine rather than the believer. Rather pithily, he summarised the argument against all good God as such. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able, but then not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh the evil? If he is neither able nor willing, why call him God? Whether directly or indirectly, this appears to be a direct critique of the earlier Platonist and later Stoic conceptions of the divine as omnibenevolent and omnipotent. Epicurus also critiqued Platonic and Pythagorean conceptions of an immortal soul, much more in line with the Aristotelian conception of the anima. For Epicurus, the soul was material, but of a delicate and fine sort, and once removed from the body, it was too weak to survive on its own. Although the Epicureans attacked the great systems of the early and middle Platonists, Peripatetics, and Stoics, they also equally attacked the sceptics of Pyrrhonism and the late Academy. It is clear from the detailed physical system of Epicureans that they wanted to establish an empirical understanding of reality, something antithetical to the sceptical cause. The first argument deployed by the Epicureans against the sceptics is called the lazy argument, which is that it is simply impossible to live as a sceptic. The second argument was the self-refutation argument. Simply put, how can you know that you don't know? Finally, a slightly more sophisticated argument they used against scepticism was called the argument from con concept formation. How can you know the concepts of knowledge and truth without the existence of knowledge and truth? Discussing the issue of knowledge, the epistemology of the Epicureans injected the first identity theory of mind in the Western tradition. This is that the mind is co-equal with the bodily functions. We now say the brain, but in the Epicureans' time, this was not an obvious choice of key organ for mental activity. This essentially argues that the mind is matter, which makes up the body. From this point, Epicurus then attempts to construct a materialistic conception of mentality. The Epicureans believed that atoms were sensible in quality. In this that he means scent, taste, and colour. 
Epicurus then used this idea to suggest that our sensations were based upon the continual emission of atom-thick layers from objects which were then carrying their sensible qualities to the organs of sensation. Our thoughts and memories are then made with these material images and stored in our material mind. Epicurus then thought that these fragile images would sometimes become distorted and mixed, resulting in delusions and illusions, such as that when an image of a man and a horse were intermixed, humans dreamt up the centaur. For Epicurus, it was this material mind which guided the body, seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. In this manner, the Epicureans are similar to the Cyrenaics, who had a hedonistic conception of the good life, but the end state for the Epicureans was very different. For the Epicureans, the goal of life was to achieve ataraxia, freedom from concern. This is similar to the Pyrrhonists, but differs in that instead of being sceptical of the world, the Epicurean comes to see it as it really is. Furthermore, unlike the Cynics, the Epicureans accepted that pleasures were not necessarily opposed to the good life. The Epicureans identified three types of pleasures, necessary, natural, and empty. The necessary was such things that humans required, such as happiness, health, and life. The natural were those that were generated from purely sensory experience, food, sex, and sweet smells. The Epicureans rejected a raw hedonistic pursuit of these sensory pleasures, though, as a simple good, also arguing for the pleasure of satiety, overcoming Plato's criticism in the Republic of Hedonism leading to addiction. In further contradiction to the Stoics and Platonists, the Epicureans saw virtue as purely instrumental. Epicurus taught that the virtues, such as classical ideas as courage, moderation, and justice, were only important so far as they enabled satiety and ataraxia. The greatest threat to these goals Epicurus thought of as the empty pleasures, the third type of pleasure. These were the ideas such as fame, wealth, and immortality, which distracted people from the good life and led them into excess, addiction, and unattainable goals. In the Epicurean model of mentality, the mind easily deludes itself, and untangling these delusions is Epicurus's key task. Such an example of an empty concept which led to the turbulence of the mind is death. The Epicureans developed two arguments to convince others that they had nothing to fear from death. The first argument was that death could not be experienced. 1. Death is annihilation. 2. The living have not yet been annihilated. 3. Death does not affect the living. So, death is not bad for the living. 4. For something to be bad for someone, that person has to exist. 5. The dead do not exist. 6. Therefore, death is not bad for the dead. 7. Therefore, death is bad neither for the living nor for the dead. The second argument was called the symmetry argument. The Epicureans simply asked the question, what was it like before you were born? This is similar to what it will be like after you die. Although the role of the individual was well developed by the Epicureans, society was seen as much more ephemeral to the Epicurean cause, unlike the Stoics or Platonists. Epicureans thought of society in almost evolutionary terms as something that had built up around humans. In the Epicurean state of nature, humans were solitary and hardy, to which there was some sense of romantic attachment, as this poverty had limited humans to natural pleasures. However, as humans grew softer, they banded together, developing societies, technology, and language. However, these societies led to the accumulation of wealth and empty pleasures. They also led to the concepts of things as such as justice, law, and fear of the gods. To Epicurus, justice was not an intrinsic good, merely an ag- agreement neither to harm or be harmed, useful for mutual association. However, out of this need for mutual benefit, the idea of friendship emerges, and to the Epicureans, this was a very important idea. Friendship allowed for humans not only to live in common, but to flourish in common. 
the Epicureans built upon the idea of friendship in the development of their communities. Instead of engaging in the hub-hub of day-to-day life, the Epicurean should retire away in a self-sustained community in which the Epicureans would pursue ataraxia. Because Epicureans would never reach beyond their necessary and natural pleasures, they argued that they would never have anything that would invite the avarice and greed of those pursuing empty pleasures, and thus they reasoned that they had nothing to fear from others. For Epicurus, at its best, philosophy had a therapeutic value which allowed the participant to reach a state of calm beyond excitement and terror. The Epicureans were always controversial, and they have, throughout most of Western philosophy's history, been the punching bag of those who opposed their physicalism and naturalism. However, in the Renaissance, Epicureanism saw a revival as philosophers attempted to topple Aristotelianism from its dominant and stifling position. In the 20th century and onwards, Epicurus has begun to shake the label of hedonism, which was laid at his feet by moralists and rivals throughout history, and those seeking to develop a materialistic and utilitarian framework often cast back to Epicurus as a guide star in their efforts. (laughs) 